Good evening, everybody. So my name is E.R. Anderson. Folks watching at home can't see me, but you can see our guests tonight. We are here to celebrate Poem at the Edge of the World with Julia Caroline Knowlton and Nell Ruby. Julia is a professor of French at Agnes Scott College in Atlanta and incoming president of the Georgia Poetry Society. She has an MFA in poetry from Antioch University and a PhD in French literature from UNC Chapel Hill. She is the author of four books and an Academy of American Poets Prize winner. She was named a Georgia Author of the Year for her 2018 chapbook, The Cafe of Unintelligible Desire. Her second chapbook, Poem at the Edge of the World, was published by Alice Green and Co. And it is the book that we are celebrating here tonight. She is joined in conversation by her friend Nell Ruby, who is a Decatur-based artist, citizen, and teacher. 2021 marked her 25th year at Agnes Scott College as a professor of art and art history. In her artwork, she constructs houses where windows, doorways, and television screens sit in the liminal space between inside and outside, imposing questions about production, isolation, and connection. Working fluidly between flat, schematic drawing, projected filmic light, solid, translucent object, and even performance, Ruby's work engages the viewer in an unsettling dialogue about power and complicity. Ruby is interested in engaging the creative process to think through, envision, and produce images and objects that challenge and build culture. So welcome to everyone who is here with us in the room and welcome to everyone watching at home. Julia has asked and really welcomed folks to ask questions. So we would love for you if you're watching at home to put your questions in the ask a question box or in the chat and I will vocalize them for you and for everyone watching here in the room with us we'll be passing the microphone to you so that the folks who are watching at home can hear we're really grateful for everyone engaging in this kind of hybrid experiment with us um, it's a great way to make sure that folks who still need to be at home can be at home but all of us who are ready to build community together in person can do so. And certainly the theme of, of this book speaks to some of that tonight. So without further ado, please welcome Julia and Al. Thank you. Thank you. So I am really glad to be here. Um, Julia invited me to talk to her about this. I think because we have just a an organically connected relationship that we um, have not pursued for 25 years. So um, the way we realized it is that we've been we're very close friends who haven't spent much time together. <laughs> we've known each other for 25 years, and we have a lot of parallel experiences. And this yeah. event has been a wonderful way to connect. Yeah, so two weeks ago, we both were um, on the on the on the hill planting our twenty five year trees, and we thought, oh, remember? And then Julia gave me this book, and it says, "For now, colleague, friend, artistic sister, and more." And then at the bottom it says, hashtag Pregnancy on the Quad, nineteen ninety eight. Yeah. So in nineteen ninety eight, Nell was pregnant with twins, and I was pregnant my second daughter and we stood there in this searing sun and talked about lots of things including the fact that we were going to have our kids so that's one of our happy memories and the other thing that happened is those kids went to school together and got to be good friends and then all of the complications between what happens when you have a baby and then the baby's grown <laughs> have happened to us in different ways and so we're back together now kind of thinking about that angle or that lens on looking at art and making art in the process of growing and being a woman artist in 2022 and all the things that go along with that and i want to i'm especially thankful to karis for who they are and what they do and um having the books here yes thank you thank you thank you it's really exciting for me to be here it's a little bit like you know mini desk concert <laughs> <laughs> But I'm an artist and I'm not a poet, so I'm really um, I'm drawn to this in a way that is different from how another writer would be. And I'm going to begin our conversation 
by um, simply talking about what happens to me when I go into a bookstore like this and I pick up a book or even what brings me into the bookstore. And that is the sort of the invitation of a book, you know, as an object. So you see the book on the stand and you judge it by its cover. And you <laughs> reach and pick it up and it's weighty and it's slim and maybe it's thin and then you open it up and you feel its pages and you see it and you um, experience it. And then you know that when you buy the book, you're promising yourself um, time, right? You're gonna have kind of a date with yourself because you get to get involved with that thing in a way that um, nobody else gets to tell you how to do it. <clears throat> and the other thing I wanna say is that the pages themselves, you know, become these worlds and they are composed exactly like a painting would be. Um, so the object is a sculpture, the page is a painting, and the spaces between the letter forms, between the paragraphs, and between even within the letter forms are all ways of marking, right? These are all things that draw you in. And actually, in anticipation of this conversation, I wrote to the designer of this book who talked about why she chose the font that she chose, and it was after reading Julia's poetry and thinking about, you know, the timber of the poetry and how that works, why she chose this classical font, etc. So just to say there's there's reasons always like, for, for how we see what we see and then how we experience what we see. And one of the things that happens is um, the white space. So poems, and I often talk to my students about this, the unoccupied space is so important to really emphasize the occupied space. Um, so blind space or space of pause is just like pause, right? It creates kind of a tension and a something and a dynamic that I think is really important. And I wonder if you might want to respond to that. Yeah, I would respond by saying that as a poet, um, the what I call the silence of the poem is I actually prefer it to the words on the page. The silence is the white space surrounding the poem. Uh, anyone who's read more than just a few of my poems could probably realize that I rather spare with, I'm not one to write poems that spill on for pages and pages. I also see the poem surrounded by white space the way we might look at a work of visual art in a frame, by which I mean that this, the silence of not language is surrounding what I'm saying. So on that note, let me read a poem. Well, I think that every poem exists in relation to silence. And most poets I know are often anxious about silence because the silence is when we're not writing, and if you're a writer, there's always a certain amount of anxiety about how much am I writing, and I'm not writing, and any, everything like that. Uh, so, of course, one of the most permanent silences is when somebody passes away. So, I will read a poem for my father, who passed away in 2018, and it's the opening poem. It's called January Morning. January morning, awake, more knotted dreams in my hands. It stays dark past dawn. Where have you gone? With what spoken bone will you return? Now I see, dust tossed in a lake became voice. And the next poem, I will go ahead and read also. It also involves an encounter with silence in the context of stillness. The next poem in this small collection is called Nature Morte, which is the French way to say, to say a still life. So in English, a painting, the painting tradition of the still life, which is makes me think of stillborn child, but I don't want to digress too much. But the French term for that is nature morte, which means dead nature, which one could talk about that for just that alone for seven minutes, but of course we don't have time. So um, 
this next poem is a love poem. Um, I have been with my partner, a gentleman, for the past five years. And during the pandemic, we had some ups and downs, but things are going well. And so this is a love poem. It's called Nature Mort. Sun at dusk, moving across polished silver. Pieces of fruit reflect pieces of light. In a painting I cannot make, we become perfect color. Our voices still, life coming to a hush, a hush. So as you can see, I think that every poem is a dance between words and silence. So I'm yeah. happy to read a couple for you. I love the, um, the idea of still life as it relates to, of course, the artist, right? Because that's all we do all the time is set up our still lives and try to draw from life. Which of course is different from taking a photograph because it is exactly that it's actually got dimension to it and you can't quite get the the mark exactly because that's not important what's important is to get the mark as it is in that moment that you're seeing it and what kind of ions are getting into you and electrons and making you kind of create the the the, the line that is your own the personal line how does that drawing become your own so still life is perfect and i want to um if I can talk a little bit about, and I've read a lot of your books now and um, a lot of your poems, and I'm noticing just a, a real affinity for um, the art form and for the artist, and especially the woman artist. And so there were two poems that are side by side, which I think makes a, a, a lovely double. Mm -hmm. um, and one is for, um, and you probably say the names better than I do, but Berta Morso and the other for Camille Cladell. Mm -hmm. and I think those are both really important poems and really important people. And I know that in the back you also have some extensive notes about them. And I wonder if you could sort of talk about both things. So you could... Yeah, thank you. Um, right, so I do have in this collection the two poems dedicated to these two French artists. and. I hope this doesn't make too much sound. I'm going to pass around. Bear with me. I'm sorry. First, I want to show this image and then pass the book around. I hope this will work with the hybrid format. This is a self portrait of the painter Bert Morisot. I'm hoping the camera can. Okay. Thing. It's a great example of a technique that you see in many of her paintings that I find very fascinating, especially for her time period because she lived in the 19th century and she, at the edges of the painting, she just shows these messy brush, brush strokes and then she just leaves blank canvas, which I'm not an art historian, but I just find that quite remarkable, especially for a woman of that time period. And of course, I won't read the academic note, but I'll just tell you the little thumbnail on her that um, she lived from 1841 to 1895, and she was de denied formal training because she was a girl. So one thing she did was she was allowed to go to the Louvre with a chaperone and stand behind the male art students and just copy the paintings that were in the museum. I also want to say, because we do have a theme of motherhood running through these poems, that I'm also very personally touched by the fact that Bert Moiseau had one daughter, and her daughter uh, caught pneumonia in 1895. And she, of course, as a mother, thought nothing of taking care of her daughter. And in taking care of her daughter, who had pneumonia, she herself caught pneumonia and died of the pneumonia. So that's the cause of her death, was the pneumonia that she caught from her daughter. Um, she's, an over, she's an often overlooked Impressionist painter. So a painter, most people, when you say French Impressionist painting, they're going to be able to say Monet and Renoir. But here's Bert Morisot. And here's my poem called Poem for Bert Morisot. 
Black velvet ribbon with one pearl tied at the nape of a delicate neck. Balcony window open towards sea. Here is a mother and child, a sewing basket and lace, a floral path to a garden gate close. Your forever strokes of color, all shades of white and gray, lie veiled in a cradle of pale rose. At the edges, sometimes, you leave your face of canvas unfinished, that bare cloth, your greatest dare. So let me also add that um, being a woman, women at that time period were not expected to even walk around outside in public. They were expected to stay home. And so naturally, she's going to end up painting domestic scenes, interior scenes, women in the garden, women sewing. Um, she does have some beach scenes, but she's with her husband. So I tried to capture in the poem that sense of um, the domestic sphere, but also the desire to get out of that. And that's one way that I see the, the, that kind of messy, unfinished edge, which of course can make us contemplate the title poem, Poem at the Edge of the World. And Nell and I have talked in preparing for this evening about the whole notion of an edge, for example, the edge of reason, I think there are very few people during the pandemic who didn't experience some moments of feeling like they're at the edge of reason, meaning making sense of things, reason versus lack of reason, um, so much confusion, etc. So edges. And in your work, edges of rooms and houses and roofs and floor and wall and perspective mm -hmm. and how are you seeing it are you seeing it from within the window and looking out or outside looking inside and what sort of what sort of spaces are between and obstacles are between you and that and what draws you out and what draws you in or keeps you in what's a what's a place that invites you in or out and what keeps you in and fences you in. Mm -hmm. all the things are in perspective definitely do you want to read the title poem? Um, yeah, yes. Okay, uh, the title poem is called Poem at the Edge of the World, and I wrote this poem after a very long, solitary walk along the Pacific Ocean during my last residency as during my MFA. And I was just completely overcome by the power of the ocean. Poem at the Edge of the World. Words without ink on paper cloud, the place where land sinks to sea, ocean on black rock, owed to you and me. At this end, every poem becomes a wave, then every wave becomes every one. Nothing of something already written, never to be read. Only snow foam, pearl eyes, bones, coral made. No vanishing listen, no dead, no day. Silver on silver, love in love with love, these lines salt spray. I love that poem, and I love the notion of the ocean. And I love the essential nature of the ocean, the waves, the water, the air, the salt, the things that you can't name except when you're there and experiencing it and the idea of light you know which is how we see everything and the idea i think of the essential mark which we talked about also in preparation so your sense of the essential word it's not just you know poetry is really about what is that word definitely and when you talked about the marks of the artists you know like what is that mark that mark is the one you know that's right the one. right and you can't put them all over you have to put them so that you can see them and you now have talked about the essential mark you've given a talk on campus as well and that you encourage your students to make an essential mark that sometimes they're timid yeah and I can tell everyone who's here in person and virtually that I feel timid too. Um, I think that 
there's a certain humility with you know that infamous blank page or blank canvas. You know, what do I do? And I know I can only say for myself, I have to just stay right there with that nervousness because I think the minute that it becomes you know easy and confident for me to start putting my words on the page, then I probably have lost something that I need to not lose. Because I think that I should approach it with it's it can be reverence, it can be stress, it can be nervousness. Sometimes I live right next door to this bookstore. Literally, I'm looking at my house next door, and sometimes I drag a chair right in the middle of the backyard, and it might look like I'm doing nothing because I don't have a book, I don't have my phone, but I may actually be thinking about a couple of words or a line, and I need to just it, it looks like, what's she doing just sitting there in the middle of the day? <laughs> but the wheels are turning. But, I mean, we talk a lot about process, you know? I mean, I think that whole idea of the essential mark, which you don't know it's essential until you make the other marks and then take some away and yes. put some more back. And which one is it? And yes. you just have to sort of trust yourself that you're going to get there, which there's so many things that we can relate about. But I start thinking about teaching. You know, how do you teach art? Well, of course, you can't. Right? But what you can do is you can talk about the experience of making. And you can talk about it in a way that isn't about the product or whether you're going to be you know, the next most famous and the best or whatever. It's not about that at all. It's the fact, I think, that we have the capacity to do it. And that because we have that capacity and we can experience it, everyone should be invited to do that. I love that. And I want to say to the student I see here and to all other students, and I'm still a student, that, you know, thinking about essential marks and holding this in my hand, I'm thinking about my wonderful editor. I don't know if she's here. I hope she is. Jill, if you're here, hi. And, um, you know, I think there are 14 poems in this chapbook. And I can assure you there are 54 poems that did not make it in here. It doesn't mean that they're not also essential marks. They're just waiting. Maybe they'll turn into something else. But um, it, I love what you're saying about whether it's gardening or um, taking care of pets or children or writing a poem or painting, the creativity. I know for, in my life, if I can just protect the time and space for my creativity, which is poetry, that is a lifeline for me. And especially because we have talked about, you know, raising children, and yeah. working full time, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's two things that I want to bring up. And one is the word that you brought up last time we had coffee, where you said, Unheimlich, unheimlich, with my limited German, which is the feeling of unease or uncomfortableness. Or it's the German yeah. term for the word uncanny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that kind of feeling that you experience when you make in the process of making. Yeah. So, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I first learned the German term in grad school um, and it's an amazing word in German because it contains the, the word home within it. And I don't speak German. I just know a few terms. So the Unheimlich is Heim means home. But within the word is also the concept of this doesn't feel like home. So the uncanny, it's like this is an uncanny feeling or in dreams, which I believe are deeply related to poetry and art, are dreams. Dream life. In fact, there's yeah. a theme in this chapbook. The, the one of the epigraphs is, um, "I live a permanent dream that stops neither night nor day," which is from the French. But anyway, the uncanny is, for example, related to déjà vu. I think I've seen this before, but I'm not sure. And it's that whole edge again, that edge between, you know. For every poem I write, there are eight poems hiding behind it that I'll never write, and so many other examples. Um, 
so part of the, the German term that Unheimlich is, for example, those of us who've we left our parents' homes for a while, and then you come back and you recognize it, but yet you really don't recognize it. Who am I? Did I ever live here? But you know you did live here. And I think that the work of art has something related to that. Where you're at home, you know, when I write a poem, this is something I'm meant to do, but at the same time, I'm wiggly and not exactly sure where I am. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> so I tried to organize my notes, and so I ended up like, I'm like this is how they, you know. I know the visual. Part. I love I the visual process. Yeah. I'm just we could have a talk just about now. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm going to tell you about this and this and this. So two things. One, is, well, I'll come back to that. But um, the idea of, of women, girls, mothers, daughters, partners, wives, like that whole notion of, uh, and I just forgot to say this about the other artists, but it's like you know. We all, uh, we all have that experience uh, of wondering about our own mental health. And is an artist simply a crazy person, or is this, a, you know, a, a proper, healthy expression of, of personhood? And of course, that all depends on who's in charge and who gets to say that, right? And also, when we look at our culture, and we're in this culture that is ill in many ways, and so how do you become, how do you be a reasonable person within that? I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. But when, when, I was, when you were talking about the ocean, and I was thinking about light, and I was thinking just about power, and that the poem you read at the edge, edge of the world is a love poem. Mm -hmm. And like that made me think about kind of the taboo of being a professional academic and talking about love. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. such a great point. And when I read, uh, Bell Hooks' book, uh, what is it? Uh, um, oh gosh, what is it? It's the, at the uh, teaching. Take your time. Head teaching to transgress. No, teaching to transgress is another one, but this one is called something. It's here in my notes, right here. Pedagogy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> of Love, Teaching for Humanity. Uh -huh. And I read her, and she, I think it's like in the first paragraph, and she said, I love my students. And I was like, oh my God, I love my students too, but I've never been able to say it because you're not allowed to, you know? And the whole idea, I think, of what I do when I teach and when I relate to you and when I read your book and I have my day with myself um, is, is about love, you know? And that is such a, um, you know, that's, oh, that's romantic and it's not academic mm -hmm. and all those things. The, the idea of the power of um, being intimate is really, all there is. I mean, that's what it's about. So, just wanted to bring that yeah. up, <laughs> and then I really wanted to, to hear um, to hear the um, the self portrait with solitude. Sure. Thinking about yeah, just thinking about time. Okay. Here it is. This poem uh, is an interesting example of the poems that are not in here because I wrote during the pandemic a handful of, I wrote self-portrait with anger, self-portrait with joy, self-portrait with, I think there's others in here, self-portrait with loss of appetite, self-portrait with solitude, and self-portrait with solitude has to do with having raised my two daughters, they're both young adults, they're both living independently and finding myself in a phase of life where I'm no longer grabbing half an hour periods of time willy-nilly. I actually have time. I don't have to get them to school. Or, of course, I miss them, and, and you're going to hear about their loneliness in the poem, too. But So the point is loneliness versus solitude. So this poem is Self-Portrait with Solitude. Here is the longed-for hour, desired time impossible during nights and years of being wife and mother, the tiny socks, the sex, cakes with candles lit, blood and spit up, enough to make you mad. Do you ever miss the chaos? No one calls, so you text. You turn loneliness into what you wanted all along, lounging alone in a clean bed, 
all the pink dawn in coffee, poem into poem, mute lines, this stillness. So in this poem, I write enough to make you mad, and it's both meanings of mad. You know, whenever the ideal mother never yells at her children or gets mad or angry at them, that's like the Virgin Mary holding the Christ child in the Western Christian tradition. The reality is that every mother gets mad at everyone. Um, but then the other meaning of mad is, you know, losing your sense of reason and feeling wobbly with your emotional health. Um, and I did experience postpartum depression after my first daughter was born. Many women do. And so I think that another taboo, I mean, it's interesting what you say, how little we speak of love, even though that's what we all need and want so very much. But it's also this kind of taboo, like, don't talk about if you feel like you're on the edge. And yet we know, it's, and it's become so, so much worse during the pandemic that everyone has traveled to that edge where they have felt like they might lose it. You know, and I'm very fortunate insofar as my job, my friends, my partner, my family, my ability to write has kept me in balance, but I think we all, well, I'll just say for myself, I think to acknowledge like we all lose our balance is a way that we stay in balance, to acknowledge that, that we're not always in balance. Mm -hmm. So there's that poem. I love that. And, uh, you know, um, you talked about time. And you know, I, I mentioned it at the beginning, and it's just like, I can't believe that, we, that it was 25 years ago that we stood in that Yeah, room and 25 years ago. Day, you know, that the kids are 25, and that, that's, you know, I have, I mean, I know your children, I love them so much. I have just, I've had more time with your child than I have with you. Like, it's just been such a, an incredible thing to, 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 that has blossomed with me. Um, but I think about time, and that brings me to the idea of luxury and um, efficiency, right? So as, as oppositional. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, poems are, poems are, are poems a luxury or are they efficient? Are poem, what's the question? Are poems a luxury or? Are poems a luxury? I'm just, I, I've been really thinking about the idea of luxury as not like, you think of luxury as something extra. And I'm, I'm starting to think of luxury as something like absolutely fundamentally important. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking about it in terms of kind of art. You know, I think art is fundamentally important. And I'm just, you know, a poem, again, you have to have time to read a poem. You can't just read a poem like efficiently. You can't read a poem like you're reading a report or write a poem like you're writing a report. Mm -hmm. I don't know, do you have any things that... Oh, sure, I mean, for one thing, I know many, many writers who are scared of poems, novelists, uh, short stories. When I did my MFA, I was surprised by how many other graduate students write you know, poems, please. So, <laughs> poems are strange, and uh, what I like to say, because I'm really eager to hear from other people questions, but yeah. I mean, what I like to say about poems is what intrigues me is that when you look at some of the most memorable moments in human life, birth, weddings, big inaugurations, uh, death, memorial services, what is read? Poems are read. And to me that nobody wants poems are People are scared of them. No, no, no. I'll read a short story, but it just is something I think about often. That at these incredibly memorable moments, the, the poems come out and the poets come out. So um, that happened just a couple of weeks ago. I mean, probably one of the most memorable 
memorials that I've been to was all poems. Oh, for Professor Moon. Yeah. Yes. Can I, um, I think maybe we could end on this one, yeah. which is, uh, and then open it up for questions, but um, the poet's dream. I had turned to the <laughs> same color. <laughs> Just like we literally did not decide to wear the same colors. <laughs> this is the Nell and Julia parallel. Mm -hmm. And let me preface it with the Ezra Pound. Sure. So in the beginning of the, beginning of the book um, is a, uh, one of the first it says, and I love this because it's for my mother, Karen Knowlton, and then you begin with a poem about your dad. But between those two pages is um, a, a little piece by Ezra Pound, and I'm just going to read it because your poem that you're going to read is after Ezra Pound. Mm -hmm. So, in a state, would you like to read it? No, no, go ahead. <laughs> in the station of the Metro, the apparition of these faces in the crowd, pebbles on the wet black bow. Yeah, so that's one of Ezra Pound's most famous poems, and most many people recognize it. So I have thought a lot about that poem. To me, it's the perfect poem because in two lines, it creates, in two lines of verse, it creates an entire impression. It creates a mood. It paints a picture. It describes a place in the world, and it connects that to an imaginary Place. So I was happy that my editor did include this one. It's the final poem, and I think it's a good place to stop for Q and A. So this, the last poem in "Poem at the Edge of the World," is called "Poet's Dream." After Ezra Pound, the apparition of these words on the page: "Blackbirds departing in a white sky." Thank you for listening to our conversation. It's been a well, honor. I just have to say it. <laughs> so you say black and white is uh, maximum contrast. Mm -hmm. Like that's the focal point. Like mm -hmm. if you're working in, in visual language and you want something to really be where the reader looks, you put, you know, you put that contrast there. And I am forever envying painters, and a lot of my poems uh, refer to paintings. And I told you now, I want to paint, I've painted a little, I'm super intimidated, but just the color, the color, because, and I know I see writers in the room, we just, it's just the black and white. So, thank you again. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both, um, and thanks to everybody watching at home.